Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome to another video. So today we are going to talk through my top 10 picks for cards from Murders at Karlov Manor for the Pioneer and Explorer formats, so uh, the formats that I play most regularly on the channel. Um, so we now have the full spoiler for Murders at Karlov Manor and the set comes out uh, in just over a week, so uh, always exciting to get new cards added to Arena and see what uh, is uh, going on. Um, so in the usual style, I'll start with some honourable mentions and then dive into the top 10. Um, so the set in general is interesting. Um, obviously it's a set set on Ravnica and Ravnica is always quite a popular plane. Um, I've seen a few comments that maybe the power level is not, uh, not what previous sets have been um, so it'll be interesting to see what kind of splash this has in these eternal formats. Um, but there are some interesting cards and certainly more than enough to uh, fill out a top 10 um, with honourable mentions. So let's start there. So my first honourable mention is Alquist Proft, um, which is a 3-3 human legendary human detective for three with vigilance. When it enters the battlefield, investigate, and then you can pay X, white, and two blue and tap it to sacrifice a clue. You gain uh, you gain X life and draw X cards. So essentially it's a Sphinx's Revelation, um, which is uh, you know a very powerful ability. Sphinx's Revelation used to be an absolute all-star um, in standard. It's probably been power crept out of Pioneer, Pioneer and Explorer in recent time. Um, but uh, you know the ability to do this over and over again, and just requiring a clue token is uh, is interesting um, and powerful. I'm not sure it'll see a huge amount of play, just because obviously you can't do it the turn it comes into play. Three three for three is kind of meh on rate, um, and yeah, it does investigate when it enters the battlefield, so you still get a little bit of value, even if the opponent kills it right away. Uh, but you know, I could see trying this in a kind of blue white control shell, uh, one of the one of the few creatures you might have one or two copies of this, um, and just. Uh, kind of see if you can uh, get a little bit of investigate synergy going on. Um, so yeah, that's Alquist Proft. Then we've got Gleaming Gear Drakes. So this is an uncommon um, blue-red for a 1-1 one, one flying artifact drake. And when it enters the battlefield, investigate. And whenever you sacrifice an artifact, you put a plus one, plus one counter on it. So obviously, you know, 1-1 one, one flying for two is is uh, not, not nothing to write home about, but obviously it does come with that additional value. And, you know, there's a lot of incidental artifact sacrificing in this... Uh, um, in this uh, format, um, so it's not just a case of you know, and it's and it's not it, this card doesn't just have to be non-token artifacts. So you know, you sacrifice a clue token, you sacrifice a treasure token, you're getting plus one plus one counter on it. In a in the right deck, this could get very big very quickly. Um, so yeah, there's potential there, I think, to uh, to kind of do something. Um, then our third honourable mention is Intrude on the Mind. So this is a five mana, three and two blue instant. Reveal the top five cards of your library and separate them into two piles. An opponent chooses one of those piles. Put that pile into your hand and the other in your graveyard. Create a naught naught colourless Thopter artifact creature token with flying. Then put a plus one plus one counter on it for each card put into your graveyard this way. So this is an interesting variant on the sort of fact and factual fiction Um uh, a style of card so you know you look at look at the top five it's interesting that you separate them and then the opponent chooses them rather than the other way around i would probably prefer it to be the other way around uh, just because your opponent does have a huge has probably more control this way around of what goes into your hand um but you do get the thop to token so in sort of a control deck it does give you a threat as well on the board as well as at you know almost always at least two cards of card advantage um potentially more so, you know, it's competing in that space for kind of memory deluge, which uh, doesn't have this kind of weird, you know, get m mini game with your opponent. So, so perhaps it doesn't see a huge amount of play, but I'm interested in it nonetheless. Another card, which I'm not convinced will see play, but I'm interested in, um, uh, it's kind of the, the space uh, for, for these in these honorable mentions is Leyline of the Guild Pact. So a new Leyline card. So like all Leylines, if it's in your opening hand, you could, you can begin the game with it on the battlefield. And it costs one Selesnia, one Civic, one Golgari, and one Gruul Manor. So, so it's kind of four, four green or any variant thereof. Um, and each non-land permanent you control is all colours. And lands you control are every basic land type in addition to their other types. So, you know, there's some kind of domain shenanigans that you can do around this, which, to be honest, if you don't have ley lines, seem pretty weak uh, without it. Um, but, you know, there are there's also things like uh, this just is for green devotion. Um, so in a mono green devotion deck, if you start with this on the battlefield so you've you know you've got four devotion before you even start yeah it doesn't do a huge amount else in that deck but maybe that's enough uh so that you know that's just something worth paying attention to 
Then we've got Massacre Girl, Known Killer, so a 4-4 with Menace. Creatures you control have Wither, so they deal damage to creatures in the form of minus one, minus, minus one counters. And whenever an op a creature an opponent controls dies, if its toughness was less than one, draw a card. So this is kind of... While this is on the battlefield, it's almost pseudo whenever an opponent, uh, a creature an opponent controls dies, you draw a card simply because, you know, if they're being damaged in combat, then they're getting the minus one, minus one counters. So it's, you know, it's powerful. It's potentially kind of, you know, the 4-4 menace and giving all your creatures wither is pretty good by itself. But then there's the marginal upside that this could potentially draw you two or three cards in a game. Um, again, it's got that kind of doesn't really do anything when it comes into the battlefield problem, and it's competing in four at the four drop slot in black with cards like Shieldred, so it's got a lot of competition. But I like it. I like the design. It's interesting. It's different, and we'll see if it sees any play. And our final honorable mention is War Leader's Call, uh, one red white for an enchantment creatures you control get plus one plus one, and whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, it deals one damage to each opponent. So I'm specifically thinking of this in say Boros uh, Convoke and other kind of token strategies you know not only does it provide the pump to the entire team but you know you're a deck that's going wide you're playing a lot of tokens uh the uh, the um, gleeful demolitions and and you know this is just a way of kind of helping close out the game burning the opponent a bit further uh, you know four or five damage in a game is is quite significant so you know i'm not convinced by it i think maybe this that deck's trying to do other things and this is just kind of a distraction um you know it's not really adding creatures to the board that you can convoke with but I'm probably going to try it. So those are honourable mentions, so we'll move on to our proper list now. So our number 10 is technically 10 cards. It's the entire rare uh, land cycle from this deck. So these are um, dual lands which have the basic land type. So for example, Lush Portico is a Forest Plains. And they, enter, they all enter the battlefield tapped, and they all have the ability that when they enter the battlefield, you surveil one. So as I say, there are 10 of them. So there's Lush Portico, which is green-white, Raucous Theatre, which is black-red, Shadowy Backstreet, which is uh, white-black, Thundering Falls, which is blue-red, uh, Underground Mortuary, which is black-green, Elegant Parlour, which is red-white, Hedge Maze, which is green-blue, Commercial District, which is red-green, Undercity Sewers, which is uh, blue-black, and Meticulous Archive, which is blue-white. So these are an interesting set of lands. So they are a strict upgrade on temples, um, the temples are the scry lands that enter the battlefield tapped, which are also in the format. Um, so these have the uh, have the basic land types, which makes them slightly better for things like domain, and also surveil in general, with some very rare exceptions, is better than scry, just because if you want to put, you know, there are things you can put in the graveyard, and the graveyard is much easier to interact with than the bottom of your library. You're fueling things like your delve cards. You know, there's just lots of different synergies which generally make putting something in the graveyard better than putting it to the bottom of your library. So they are better than the temples, but having said that, I think they are one of the weaker land cycles of the format. Um, they uh, obviously they always enter the battlefield tapped, which uh, a lot of the most powerful lands, you know, thinking shock lands, fast lands, um, they don't. Um, you know, they often will enter untapped, so that is a disadvantage. And being fetchable um, off uh, off the fetch lands, things like uh, the Cayman Cards of Tarkir, is less of a consideration. It, in Explorer and Pioneer, simply because the fetch lands don't exist in those formats. So in some, somewhere like Modern, you could imagine um, maybe seeing one or two copies of this as a kind of fetchable land in certain decks. Um, these will certainly see some fringe play in the same way the Temples do. You know, Temples, particularly in combo decks, where like you, the additional scry value is pretty good in terms of building the hand that you want. Um, these, some of those still use Temples, so you can imagine that there may be a few decks which uh, use these as well. Um, you know, the ones where it doesn't matter quite so much if it enters the battlefield tap, so I'm thinking specifically of the blue-white one, perhaps the uh, blue black one you know the kind of more natural control colors you know they might have more of a home there um where like the fact that they always enter the battlefield tapped is not so much of a consideration so uh yeah i think fringe play but they're not going to be staples of the format like other land cycles are um but it's always nice to see new rare lands it'll be interesting i'm sure they'll make a big splash in standard but less so i think in explorer and pioneer but they do uh, get a slot on the list then uh, it's always nice to have a common card um so number nine we have pick your poison so this is a one green sorcery it says choose one each opponent sacrifices an artifact each opponent sacrifices an enchantment each opponent sacrifices a creature with flying so this is a potential sideboard all-star um you know that ability to just very 
have this kind of scalpel for particular strategies, particularly looking at the modes of sacrificing an enchantment and sacrificing a creature with flying. The nature of the format means that you almost hit you almost always hit what you want, because they're not they're probably not going to have more than one. Um, it's pretty rare to have more than one enchantment or creature with flying um, on the battlefield at any given time. So, so you know, I think that uh, that sacrifice mode means that you will almost always hit what you want. The artifact mode is less good because of you know, there's just so many incidental artifact tokens in the in the format. You know, blood tokens, clue tokens, treasure tokens that often the opponent will just not have to sacrifice what you're actually targeting. One mana is very aggressively costed, so we will see if this sees some sideboard play. Um, I'm sure it will end up in a few of my sideboards at some point along the way. Then at number eight, uh, so this is a fun one. So we have Krenko's Buzz Crusher. So this is two and two red for a 4-4 artifact insect thopter with flying and trample. When it enters the battlefield, for each player destroy up to one non-basic land that player controls. For each land destroyed this way, its controller may search their library for a basic land card, put it onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle. So this is... Uh, Firstly, I mean, I have to say it's aggressive stats for a red creature. You know, 4-4 four, four flying trample for four is uh, not bad at all. Um, you know, red doesn't get a huge amount of flying creatures. So to see one with these kind of aggressive stats is pretty welcome. Um, and there is a kind of, uh, it has that kind of field of ruin effect, you know, destroying a non-basic land, letting the opponent search their library for a basic land to replace it. And you may have seen on the video a couple of weeks ago, maybe a week ago, I played a Jund land destruction deck um, that kind of exists on the fringes of the format at the moment. And I really think this actually provides a very powerful addition to that deck, because that deck is using a lot of sorceries, a lot of instants, and not really adding to the board. Now, this kind of does a similar thing to what other cards in the deck are doing, but it gives you a 4-4 creature with flying and trample to go alongside it, gives you that kind of additional uh just the ability to kind of attack the opponent with something um and also an additional upside which uh kind of keen-eyed players will have spotted is that this does not target it just says destroy up to one non-basic land that player controls that means it can destroy lotus fields um, which most of these effects can't do so you know there's some marginal upside there and i think you know you're kind of building out this strategy of jun land destruction and maybe something like this will help power the deck up and provide an actual threat so you know and it's fun. It's a fun deck to play, and if you ever can hit an opponent's lotus field, you will feel incredibly smug. So that's always worth uh, something. Um, so that is number eight. Number seven, we have Delny Streetwise Lookout. So this is a 2-2 for three mana, legendary human scout. Creatures you control with power two or less can't be blocked by creatures with power three or greater. And if an ability of a creature you control with power two or less triggers, that ability triggers an additional time. Now, we are used to cards in standard sets being designed for Commander now. It's a pretty tedious aspect of modern magic. But I think this has potential outside of EDH um, in these formats. It is the cheapest panharmonicon style effect available. Um, you know, that kind of doubling up of triggers. And it's not just enter ETB triggers, it's cast triggers. It's... Um, it's uh, sorry, it's not cast triggers, but it's death triggers and those kind of things. So, so you know, there 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 is something there about... Um, it just being more kind of uh, more all encompassing than a panharmonicon, and there's a lot of synergy with good white creatures in the format. You know, Thraben Inspectors creating two clues instead of one, Spirited Companions drawing two cards instead of one, Thalia's Left Head and triggering twice instead of once. You know, a two-two for three is not necessarily entirely what you want to be doing, and the the kind of the the unblockable element of it is okay. Um, you know, and it'll certainly help you against certain strategies. But that uh, that doubling up of triggers in a format where we know that cheap, good white creatures with ETB effects um, with power two or less are already quite good. Um, there is, uh, you know, I think this is worth certainly being in the conversation for a card that's going to see some play. So that is number seven. Then number six is a card I haven't seen a huge amount of talk about, but I'm pretty high on. Um, I could be wrong, I usually am. But the uh, Blood Spatter Analysis is a black-red rare enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, it deals three damage to target creature and opponent controls. And whenever one or more creatures die, you mill a card and, and put a Bloodstain counter on it. And then you sacrifice it if it has five or more Bloodstain counters. And when you do, you return a creature from your graveyard to your hand. So this is very cheap and decent early removal in the game, you know, three damage to any creature an opponent controls is generally going to kill most of uh, of the threats that you know, present themselves in the early game. And then there is the threat that you can blink this and just do it again, you know, in that kind of Oath of Kaya style ability. We've kind of seen Yorian decks and the like, which make the most of those kind of abilities, you know, recurring the, the card, getting more value off it. 
So, and you know, it's pretty cheap. So, so you could potentially have a couple of these, um, which you can't have with Oath of Kai because it's legendary on the battlefield. You know, you blink them, suddenly you're taking out a lot of your opponent's creatures. So, I think that's underrated as an ability that it can just come back. And you know, the bloodstain counter effect is not like, well, five creatures die and then I can get something back to my hand. It's not the most powerful thing, but it comes with no cost. You know, if it just sits there while other creatures die, eventually you're going to get some value off it, and it pot potentially recur a powerful threat, you know, another shielded. Black-red are already colours we know are good in this format, so any black-red card that has an interesting effect or powerful effect is worth paying attention to. So that is Blood Spatter Analysis. So moving on to number five, we had Deadly Cover-Up, which is a five-mana black sorcery, and it says, as an additional cost to cast this spell, you may collect Evidence 6. Now, if you haven't seen this ability before, collect Evidence essentially means to exile a certain mana value's worth of cards from your graveyard. So to collect Evidence here, you need to exile cards with six or more total mana value from your graveyard. And then the ability of the card is destroy all creatures. If an ev if evidence was collected, exile a card from an opponent's graveyard, then search its owner's graveyard hand and library for any number of cards with the same name and exile them. That player shuffles, then draws the card for each card exiled from their hand this way. So this is a kind of smashing together of a uh, a kind of a, a, a mass removal wrath ability with a, a sh surgical extraction style ability. Um, so it's quite a fun different uh, just kind of smashing together of those abilities. Um, the solid unconditional black wrath is uh, reasonably unusual in uh, in this format. You know they're usually sort of ritual of soot, languish, um, shadows, verdict, that kind of thing. So the ability to just destroy all creatures in black is pretty good. Um, the mana cost may hold it back a little because it is five mana, but it's good for kind of Demir and other basically control decks that don't run white um, as a kind of a, a alternative uh, mass removal spell. Um, the additional upside is potentially very good in certain matchups, you know, that ability to kind of scalpel away a particularly powerful card. You know, you can think of things like Shieldred, perhaps Grease Fang, you know, things, decks which really rely on a single creature or a single card. Um, and it doesn't just have to be those from the uh, from the card that from the cards which are destroyed. So you know, if they have a planeswalker in the graveyard that you want to get rid of the rest of them, you can also do that. It doesn't just have to be the creatures which uh, you've destroyed with this spell. Um, and also, it doesn't say non basic land or anything like that. So there's maybe some fun shenanigans you can do against a mono color deck where you essentially just take away all of the lands in their library. Um, you know, there's there's plenty of versatility in this that makes it an interesting design. Uh, you know, wraths are good in general. Um, there's no drawback if you don't collect the evidence. It is just five mana destroy all creatures, but potentially very high upside if you can. Uh, so yeah, I'm uh, looking forward to playing with this one. It's a, a good card, an interesting one. Um, number four, we have, uh, oh my god, it's Lightning Helix, etc. So this is a uh, red-white instant that says it deals three damage to any target and you gain three life. So this is a reprint from the original Ravnica set or way back when, um, but it is new to Pioneer and Explorer. So first time in these particular formats. And for anyone who has seen this card, see play and other, it's uh, things like modern. It is a very powerful burn spell that kind of fulfills a number of functions. And um, it kind of works very well in aggro decks because it's, uh, you know, it's basically a lightning bolt staple to a healing salve. So you are dealing a decent amount of damage to any target. So you can do it to the opponent's face. And then the, the life gain ability is very good, particularly in kind of aggro mirrors. Or if you've got something like Eidolon of the Great Revel, which is hitting your life total as well as your opponent's that kind of six life swing, six point life swing that this card offers is very good, but it's also very good in control decks, Jeskai control decks and those kind of things where it's just a very versatile and good removal spell, like anything that can just deal with end, you know, creatures, planeswalkers hitting the opponent's face. Lightning Helix is good gains you the life. Yeah, it's just a very, very powerful uncommon. Um, it perhaps helps revive Boros Burn as an archetype in these formats. Now, we don't have Boros Charm in Explorer yet, so we will be kind of waiting for that one, I think, before this card sees uh, any kind of potential splash of play in the that that style of strategy, but I'll be interested if this can kind of power up any other colour combinations of control and things like that. And, you know, Lightning Helix, it's a great card. Number three, we have Archdruid's, Char Archdruid's Charm, which is a bit of a mouthful. So this is three green for an instant. Um, it says choose one, search your library for a creature or land card and reveal it. 
put it onto the battlefield tapped if it's a land card, otherwise put it into your hand, then shuffle, put a plus one plus one counter on a target creature you control, it deals damage equal to its power to target creature you don't control, or exile target artifact or enchantment. So this is perhaps the beginning of a mega cycle with Arch Mage's Charm from Modern Horizons, um, which was the kind of three blue mana equivalent of this. So, I mean, this is just incredibly powerful. It's one of the best ramp spells of all time. It can be done at instant speed. It can fetch any land. It's not just basic lands or lands with a certain land type. So you're thinking, you know, three green mana. Where where might this see play? Well, probably in mono green. You know, the ability to just kind of instant speed fetch a Nykthos, get whatever creature you want and put it into your hand. You know, that first mode is just incredibly powerful, uh, particularly in decks which can kind of afford the uh, the slightly awkward mana cost of the card. Uh, yeah, it's kind of I think it's the cheapest unconditional land uh, fetch uh, fetch land sort of uh, land ramp in the uh, in the format. Um, and those other two modes aren't to be sniffed at either. You know, the ability to kind of punch down an opponent's creature or to exile a problematic artifact or enchantment that the opponent has. You know, like all charms, that versatility is part of what makes it so powerful you know it's the three mode card but it kind of has five modes you know searching for either a creature search searching for a creature searching for a land doing the bite ability exiling an artifact or exiling an enchantment there's kind of five modes hidden in those three so you know there's just a lot of interesting and powerful effects to choose from and you can kind of calibrate it to whatever you need to do at that particular time you know the first mode is obviously kind of where it's going to be at most of the time but yeah, just very, very good. Exciting. Probably one of the best cards from the set. Number two, I'm not surprising to see this one here. We have No More Lies. This is White Blue Instant. Um, that says counter target spell unless its controller pays three. If that spell is countered this way, exile it instead of putting it in its owner's graveyard. So this is Mana Leak with a few more, with a bit more of a color restriction. Um, so this is the first time that we have seen the mana leak style effect in this format, so countering a spell unless it's a controller pays three for two mana. Um, so this goes straight to the top of the available counter spells um, in the format. It will immediately become a staple of blue-white control decks. Blue-white control is seeing a bit of a resurgence in the format. We've certainly faced it a lot recently, um, and this just makes uh, powers up that deck uh, a huge amount. Um, and the exile clause provides additional upside. You know, there are a lot of cards which rely on the graveyard. You know, if you use this on a green Fang. Well, they're not bringing the uh, the Grease Fang back from the graveyard. If you if you're in a mirror match, a control mirror match, you use it on a memory deluge. Well, they're not going to be able to flash back the memory deluge. So in some ways, it's more powerful than Mana Leak. Um, the color restriction is a marginal downside, so you can only play this in a very specific combo uh, color combination but it's the one that most wants this card you know blue white control is the most powerful control deck in the format so it's not a surprise that this is going to i mean it's it's kind of a slam dunk for the card which i'm most confident will see a lot of play in the formats because it is just a strict upgrade on a lot of the cards that that deck's running already yeah so no more lies is our number two and then our number one is a very exciting, interesting uh, card, um, Reenact the Crime. So this is one and three blue for an instant that says exile target non-land card in a graveyard that was put there from anywhere this turn. Copy it, you may cast the copy without paying its mana cost. So this is another one of those cards which is a bit like Beseech the Mirror from a couple of sets ago and actually has a kind of similar mana cost, which is quite interesting. Um, that has It just has infinite breakability potential. Uh, that ability to just kind of essentially cheat any card into play um, for four mana as long as it was put in a graveyard this turn. You know, there are, this is a format with cards like Om, uh, Omniscience and Magma Opus and all of those powerful things which, you know, other decks are trying to put in the graveyard and then kind of bring back. This is uh, This is a very cheap way of doing that. You can do it instant speed. It could be held up alongside other interaction and counter spells. So I'm, um, you know, I'm expecting this to be extremely high variance. And if you came to me in a few weeks and said, "Man, I didn't really see any play," I wouldn't be surprised either. But it's just very cool card design. You know, it, it will it, the entire strategies will be made and tested around this card. That ability to just bring back anything from the graveyard, all of these powerful, expensive spells that you can play in the format suddenly become much more available because you are in a, you are able to reenact the crime. You know, it's cool flavor, it's cool design. Yeah, I really, really like it. It's my number one and I hope it re I really hope it sees play because it's uh, yeah, it's, it's just great. So that is my top 10. So thank you for watching uh, those and uh, interested to hear what people watching think. So let me know in the comments if there are 
are things you agree with, things you disagree with, other cards from the from the uh, set that you've seen. Um, you know, I I'm excited about this set. I haven't kind of it hasn't gripped me in the way that some, perhaps some others have. But you know, the whole murder mystery thing it's cool. It's different. It's it's a slightly you know it's um it's nice flavor. So let's see how it does in the format. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for watching. Hit those like and subscribe buttons if you're coming across this channel for the first time. Normally it's uh, gameplay videos for Explorer um, on Arena, but you know we like to dip into other things from time to time, and this top 10 is one of those. So yeah, please do stick around, um, check out some of the other videos, and I will see you very soon.